Peace to everybody, Islam. First of all, I'd like to rise and give praise to my um, creator, my father, God, Allah, and all the Moors who came before me. I stand on all of your shoulders and I stand on everyone's shoulders who has already done so much research into this whole thing and so much research into this uh, this great body of history that we know today as uh, Moorish history or Moorish science. So um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. My name is Angel Yaldel Bay and I am basically making a uh, series of lectures in order to further our understanding of the Moorish paradigm and Moorish history. So there's this uh, very distinct and prevalent idea that the Moors were only existing in one place in the world, or that there was somehow a Moorish kingdom with one Moorish king who told everyone what to do, and that's not exactly the, the truth. That's not really the case at all, actually. Um, the Moors were a very, very wide and distinct um, branch of people, but their dominion spanned pretty much the entire globe. and through these lectures and through these videos, which I will make some available on YouTube, some available on Patreon, I am going to touch upon uh, certain aspects of the Moorish paradigm and the Moorish culture. Uh, please, if you hear any noise behind me, you have to excuse it because it's just, I live by a, um, a busy street, so. All right, so let's get into it. First of all, uh, let's let's go into the definition of Moor. So, Again, um, there's a lot of like conjecture as to what where more comes from, um, and the depending on where you are in the world, it's going to reflect where it was that like 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 how the word was actually thought of during that time. You understand, um, and, and in that place. So for right now, I'm trying to focus on primarily. Let's let's actually go to. Uh, Google Maps so you can get a good representation. I'm focusing right here on, um, so you can see here's Europe. I'm going to be focusing right here on the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Scotland, which is uh, right here. Here you go. You have Scotland here, the United Kingdom, and Ireland right here. So this is the, the uh, dominion that we're actually going to focus on today. And I'm going to basically show you guys how the Moors were all, all in here, all in here. Um, and, and left their mark and a considerably great mark as well. So, so let's start with the, uh, I'm going to be using as a text, Ancient and Modern Britons by David Mac Ritchie. I do not claim ownership of this book. I didn't write this book. I happen to own this particular book, um, but I, I didn't write this book. This is by David Mac Ritchie. I don't own any of the text shown and any of the photos shown. I'm only using them for educational purposes so that I may inform the public. So this is Ancient and Modern Britons, great book, highly recommend you get yourself one of these books and a couple highlighters, and both of these highlighters are dead. <laughs> you may see in some of the um, sections that I have here, I prepare here for your um, reading and stuff like that, that a lot of the uh, sections of the highlighted sections are actually starting to fade because the, the marker is starting to die. So anyway, so from page 46 of Ancient and Modern Britons. Now, when Claudian wrote, and for a long time after, let's see if we can zoom in actually, so we can, uh, there you go, yes. Now, when Claudian wrote, and for a long time after, Morris signified a great deal more than a native of Mauritania, or it may be more correct to say that Mauritania implied as such, though in a different quarter as Scythia did. Any Latin dictionary, any old one at least, will tell you that Moros is a Moor, a Blackamoor. That's odd. A blackamoor, or a tawny moor, tawny being like a little bit lighter skinned. Uh, and Shakespeare uses the word moor as a synonym for negro. As that last word bears nowadays a somewhat restricted meaning, meaning negro, it may be better to take the old fashioned blackamoor as the nearest English rendering of moros, signifying thereby any black or brown skinned man. So, first of all, I'm just trying to clear up the um the misconception that a lot of people have over the Moors and what it is that they look like. Now, while I have to agree, of course, that they were not um, unified, uh, uh, they were not a, a unified, total, um, homogenous group, you understand? They did not look exactly the same, but um, certain things have to be drawn out so that our reference point of history is correct in, in certain ways. So, as you can see, that's, that's that, right? 
So this word in particular should be of importance and interest to pretty much anybody who is coming across this video and coming across, you know, the Morse paradigm or Morse history, right? Blackamoor. So what is that exactly, right? So we're going to go ahead and I did a, uh, a post about this on my Instagram not too long ago. I took the liberty of uh, using this text as a source. This is the American Dictionary of the English Language by Noel Webster. It was compiled in 1828, as you can see down there. Um, so I, I use this dictionary very frequently, okay? So this is my Instagram, by the way. Feel free to follow me. Blackmore, noun. Black being the adjective and more being the proper noun. A Negro, a black man. So, just speaking on that, whenever you see more or, or black more or black or more, we are speaking about people who we would traditionally call today black people. But really, in reality, they're Moors, but calling them black or Moors and then finally black people was a way to denationalize them by calling them a, a, a different name renaming them and then redesignating them in history which i also have um i also see an example of that in the mori people of scotland and i'll get into that in a minute but um yeah so it's that that idea of renaming somebody to denationalize them and then calling them by a different name is very common it's a very common tactic when you're trying to denationalize a nation so let's uh, get back into it so uh, let's go back to, um, let's see here, the word more. So oftentimes in Scotland and Britain and Ireland and Britain, Britain and uh, Ireland and things like that, you'll see that the land itself will be called a moor, um, and the actual uh, uh, land mass itself will be called a moor. This is exactly why I'm going to be talking about it here. So again, this is page 49 of Ancient and Modern Britons, the word more. Um, okay. Therefore, if the word more and its variations was primarily the sea and gave its name to a nation of sea rovers, or if the case was reversed and the sea became associated with the name of a great seafaring race, then a wider vista opens out before us. Um, there have been much writ written about mere minen, <laughs> like mermen or mermaids, and other water people, and the subject is usually treated mythologically, although capable, I venture to think, of being interpreted realistically, meaning there may be some, some factual basis in these claims. This view of the origin of Moros must, however, be disregarded here, and our attention turned more directly to the dwellers amongst the Moors and Marses, Marshes. Whether they gave their name to these places, or were so styled because they inhabited them, they were, at any rate, known as Moors. Okay? <laughs> um, that is to say, that became, that became the general pronunciation given to the word. The original root seems likelier to have been more, as seen as Cornish, uh, seen, as seen in Cornish, Armorican, and other languages. Jameson, in his Scottish dictionary, says of the word Moravi, defined by him as black, swarthy, resembling a moor. <laughs> this word has certainly been used in Old English as Cotgrave gives it gives it as the sense of uh, French moor uh, ID. It is probably a contraction of the Latin moritanus, a moor. <laughs> um, uh, another English word from this root is murray, meaning dark red or copper color. Now, let's see, do I have a I feel like I do have a penny on me. I do. I do have a penny on me. So we have um, a penny, which is copper colored, and you know, a little bit lighter. But let's let's just you know, it's it's odd. It's odd that they would say copper color when oh here's here's a little bit here's, a, here's this penny right. Hmm, copper color. That's very interesting. <laughs> um looked or always in their their person their um their their current physical incarnation and that's not necessarily true so let's get in, in into that okay um so let's let's start out with the morty the picks okay <laughs> this is a great example of how you use another name to denationalize people 
Let's see here. This is uh, page 50, Ancient and Modern Britons. No, not add to. I didn't mean to hit that. Whoops. Nope, 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 nope. And Cortana, get out of here, man. Stop trying to eavesdrop on me, man. Some moment, y'all. Computer's frozen. All right, cool. All righty. Ancient Modern Britons, page 50. Uh, Lempire gives several na nations bearing names beginning with Moor. Okay? The Moray or Moriensis, or Moriensis in India. And the Moruni in that country also. And the Morini, a people of Belgic Gaul. And I believe Gaul was the, um, the old term for France. Or what, what eventually became France. Um, but I have to... Let me make sure that I... <laughs> I uh, have that uh, correct, but let's just stick to this for right now. On the shores of the British Ocean are examples. The Mori of Mauritania are perhaps the most notable examples of a nation bearing this name, though in a slightly altered shape. A branch of this family did inhabit Britain and are not only known as Mori and Moors, but also as Moravienses, Mor Morienses, identical with the name of those in India, Murray men and people of Moray or Moravia. That the Picts, okay, now listen to this, that the Picts, known to the Romans as Mori, so let's say that again, that the Picts, known to the Romans, shows that these people are essentially being denationalized because they're being referred to at, by another name that they never really went by, that they never really knew themselves by. It's a nickname. And uh, I have a slide for that as well. Um, known to the Romans as Mori, M-A-U-R-I, that's one of those more by the way, M-A-U-R, uh, were finally divided into two sections inhabiting these localities, is speaking, it is a, which is, it is well to remember at this juncture. So he's saying that that's a very important point that we need to keep track of, okay? Come on. One of the estates of this clan bore the significant name of the Black Barony. Sir Charles Amore, who fought a Chevy Chase of the same clan, shows the name in its modern form or approximately. So, like I said, um, you're going to now start to see uh, the word picked a lot in, in this presentation. And um, anytime you see picked, I'm going to replace it with the word Morty because that's really what those people were known as. Known as. I'm also just going to refer to it as more because let's be real, that's just what... That's just what it was, man. Okay. Um, so oftentimes, um, when we see the, the Moors, a lot of times they left their mark on certain places by naming it, uh, certain things with M R as the root. Okay. And we, we've seen, we saw that earlier with the word Armorica. Okay. Sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? Armorica. Sounds familiar to America, doesn't it? It's another lesson <laughs> uh, that might be on Patreon. Um, even that, uh, even a native of that land abode there, and he installed there in his own peaceful people. So they're talking about how they're um, basically moving the, the original people out of that land and placing so-called peaceful people in there. But of course, they're only peaceful because they've already murdered all of the original inhabitants, and then. <laughs> supplanted people that were just there to, to carry out you know daily life so they're only peaceful people after the original inhabitants were murdered <laughs> from this date therefore the Scottish Moravia became the home of another race than that which bestowed its name upon it okay so again these people were supplanted denationalized pushed out of the land into another land and then these other people were then put in there okay uh, Moravia became the home of another race than that which bestowed its name upon it, as the Austrian Moravia had done many centuries before. So this happened in Austria as well. The inhabitants of this province, province seem to have been regarded. This strange notion, adds Pennon, seems to have arisen from the country having been so far, so for so many ages a Moorish country, and after that under the dominion of the Danes, and during both periods in a state of perpetual warfare with the Scots and Western Highlanders, meaning the invaders of that time. 
it has been seen that many of the modern forms of this word is moray or murray. Another form is Morris. All, all of these, by the way, are, are surnames. Have you noticed that? How many people have you ever seen named Morris? Or Morrison, meaning son of the Moor. More son. Son of the Moor. How many people have you ever seen named Murray? Moray. All of that has Moorish roots. Anytime you see MR, you're always dealing with a Moor. <laughs> always. That's just how they left their mark. You ever notice that? You have you noticed in all of these names, it all starts with M, and there's an R in there somewhere. Always, <laughs> and remembered as associated with the Morris dance. Common enough in this country during the Middle Ages, it is still practiced, I believe, by English country folk. Its origin is ascribed to the Moors, though the genuine Morris dance, the Fandango of the present day, bears little resemblance to it. Fandango, wasn't there? <laughs> Hang on a second. Let me let's see if we if we can pull that up real quick. Wasn't there? Cause this this shows exactly how they use our culture. Were we on time? Okay. Uh, this shows exactly how they use our culture um, and put it right in your face and just expect you to not know what you're looking at. <laughs> as soon as I saw Fandango, immediately I was reminded of Fandango movies, which. Here you go, right here, Fandango Media. There you go. Wasn't this wasn't this a, a like a movie platform or something like that? <laughs> Fandango. <laughs> That's where this came from. Fandango. The Fandango of the present day. The genuine Moorish dance bears little resemblance to it, and they renamed the Moorish dance the Fandango. So again, they're using our culture, the Moorish culture, as a a, a new, you know, a, a new facet in modern day life, which, you know, and completely just, just changed it into something else, you know, the, the Fandango, oh, Fandango, Fandango. <laughs> yeah, it's Fandango dance. Okay, let's see here. Let's go to the, uh, the Mate. And then I'm, I'm going to show you guys um, uh, some depictions of uh, st um, Moorish landmarks in, in modern day. So just give me a, a moment. Bear with me here. Oops. The Mate or Marsh folk against whom Severus, I believe they're talking about Septimus Severus, who was a, a general, I believe, um, Severus fought, were Caledoni. Now, we'll get into Caledonia in a minute. Nicknamed Picti. Again, nicknamed Picti. Okay, so these people were denationalized, meaning their name was taken away and they were referred to as something else. And then referred to as that that same thing okay or, or that that different thing nick men of the race of demoni or Dem, demnoni who had curly hair and swarthy skin swarthy meaning dark okay um which they tattooed with their family totems now one moment I gotta... there you go so this this is a mori or a mate okay um, one of the the ancient inhabitants of the uh, Caldoni, okay. So this is exactly what they were talking about right here, right? Uh, the Mete or Marsh folk against whom Severus fought were Caledoni, nicknamed Picti, uh, known as Moors or Black Men, okay, of the race of Domini, okay. So when we talk about Caledoni and Domini, we'll we'll get into that in a moment. But here you go, right here. This is. A very clear depiction of what it is that these people look like well back in the day as you can see like they said um swarthy skin which they tattooed with their family totems and as you can see all of the intricate work on this man look at that look at the intricacy you understand And of course, look at his visage. You understand? Look at the hair. Okay, so there's no doubt. Look at the face. Look at the beard. It looks like my beard. <laughs> so that's that's a, a good representation of, of what it is that we're talking about right here. Okay. Um. So let's uh, close that. Close it, please. Thank you. 
Alrighty. Um, so when we're talking about Caledonia or Caledonia Moors, right? Um, you need to go to a map created by a man named Ptolemy, right? And for reference, let's go to, uh, so this is Ptolemy, okay? So whenever you hear me talk about Ptolemy, um, and the, the maps that he created and, and whatnot, this is Ptolemy, or this is a bust of Ptolemy, rather. Now notice, again, the, the material that they use for this bust. Usually, when they make busts and, and uh, representations of people, they'll mind what material they actually make the bust out of, okay? If someone was lighter skinned, and you know, you, you wouldn't use bronze to depict someone of lighter skin. So again, mind the color of the bust. It does matter, you understand? Because there were a multitude of, of uh, materials that bust could be made out of and fashioned out of. But this is the material that they, they chose to use for Ptolemy's bust. So, just another point you, you may want to... Um, so, going to Ptolemy's map. Right here. So this is actually a map of what we now later, I mean, uh, current, current day, call Scotland, uh, Great Britain, and um, Ireland. Except here, you can even see, remember, Caledoni, which is the ancient name for Scotland, uh, Brigantes, which is, that, that would be Britain, and Ivernia, or Hibernia. Um, it's, it's sort of, it's known as Hibernia, but right here, Ptolemy wrote it as Ivernia, so I'll refer to it as Ivernia, but I'll, I'll bring something up in a second to illustrate that. This is actually modern day, uh, um, the UK, Scotland, and Ireland. It's the United Kingdom, Scotland, and Ireland, okay? Um, now we can pull up. So we can see right here, I'm, I'm on Google Maps, by the way. Um, so as we can see here, this is the United Kingdom, Ireland, and all that. That's the modern day depiction. And right next to it, we'll juxtapose it with Ptolemy, Ptolemy's map. Um, And as you can see, it's actually the exact same. All you really have to do is rotate it in your mind because um, you have Ivernia right here, which later on became Ireland. You have Caledonia, which later on became Scotland. And you have uh, Bregante, or Bragantes here, which later on became the United Kingdom. And also Dom Domnia, Domniae, how do you say that? Let's zoom in right here. <laughs> um, which is basically Lower Britain, you see, Birmingham, London, um, the United Kingdom, but it's the exact same, all you have to do is just rotate this map a little bit this way in your mind, that's all, it's the exact same, so, uh, more examples on why Moors were probably the most noted cartographers of their day um, and showing you that we've, we've been doing this. We've been doing this for a very long time. Okay, so going back now, uh, that's, so that's, that's Ptolemy and his map. Um, so now let's get into Kenneth, King of Alban, because this is very interesting to me. I didn't really know about him all that much. And um, I never heard of him, and for good reason why. You you all know why by now. They just don't want us to know about our history. For example, we see that one of the black people, the Moors of the Romans. So that also means that the Romans were also Moors, and we can we can dive all into the Holy Roman Empire. There's so much history and stuff behind that. So we're but that's not for today. We're just. That's an entire, I could do like two separate lectures just on that alone. Um, there's a lot of a, a lot of Moorish history in Rome, uh, in, in the Roman Empire. I could talk about the Etruscans and all that type of stuff. So, for example, we see one of the black people, the Moors of the Romans, in the person of a king of Alban in the 10th century. History knows him sometimes as Kenneth, sometimes as Dub, and sometimes as Niger. Um, let's see here. Um, 
the version of the Moorish Chronicle in the Ir Irish Nennius calls him Siniad Veldud, and St. Birchin styles him Dubd of the Three Black Divisions. The, Pixi the, the Moors seem to have preserved a tradition that the whole nation was once divided into seven providences. And it would appear that the three black divisions over which Dub or the Black held sway formed that portion of the original seven which still remained untouched by the white races. In short, the Moorish providences. Provinces, I'm sorry, provinces. So areas where Moors held sway all over and were untouched by anybody else. Okay? So now to juxtapose that was something that i found i was i was trying to find uh depictions of kenneth the king of alban and here you go right here this is a bust of kenneth king of alban uh 1962 to 1997 a.d dub mac mel i'm not sure um sometimes anglicized as duff mcmalcolm niger the black was a king of alba his son, he was son of Malcolm I and succeeded to the throne when Indulf was killed in 962. Niger Valdubt, or Kenneth, uh, lived and reigned over certain black divisions in Scotland. So you see that they're talking about this right here. They're talking about the, the Moorish providences over which Dubt or the black held sway and formed that portion of the original seven which remained untouched by the white races. So, Niger Valdubt lived and reigned over certain black divisions of Scotland, or excuse me, Moorish divisions of Scotland. See how they try to denationalize us? They, we have one name, oops, Cortana, get out of here, man. Um, we see how they de denationalize us? Again, remember what I was talking about with black and more. Black and more, then eventually just black, which is why they call us black today. Um, reigned over certain black divisions in Scotland. A clan of Scots known as the Sons of the Blacks, MacDub or McDweeb. <laughs> oh, I wonder if that's why the 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 insult you're a dweeb. I wonder if that has any. I don't know. That's probably a reach. I don't know. That's that's just you know. Um, this a, a clan of Scots known as the Sons of the Blacks succeeded him in history, and that's from J. A. Rogers' Sex and Race. Okay, cool. So um, that's. And I recommend anything by J.A. Rogers. If you can find any book from J.A. Rogers, buy it. I happen to have multiple of his books. Um, this is a great one right here, Nature Knows No Color Line. That's a very, very good book. It goes all into the moors of Europe, Greater Europe, Britain, all that. Um, and, and gets into like the family crest and things like that of, of the noble moors of Europe. Very good book. And also, 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro with Complete Proof by J.A. Rogers. Also very good book. Very thin, um, pretty cheap to buy. So if you're not really a reader, like an avid reader like me, I have a bunch of, there's, my bed is literally filled with books right now. Um, so if you're not really an avid reader like I am, then you may want to just look into getting this little book. It's like 72 pages or something like that. So, yes, yeah, literally 72, 72 pages. Um, and he gives complete proof all throughout this book. So it's a very light read. It's very cheap. Here's J.A. Rogers himself. Don't worry. He's a brother, but just just lighter skin. You know what I'm saying? Um, you, you can look uh, pictures of Joel Augustus Rogers, J.A. Rogers, and you can find pictures of him. Very wise man, noted historian, hated for what it is that he found, but you can't dispute what he found. He's just, he put in serious, serious work for our people. So. 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro, and Nature Knows No Color Line. I highly recommend anyone who really wants to get into the history, start with this book right here. Start with this book. Great book. Two very great books right here. Alright. So anyways, that's uh, Kenneth, uh, or, or Niger Valdubt. Okay. Um, yeah. And Modern Gaelic Dubt. Me Mahal, oh my gosh, I'm not even gonna try. I'm not even gonna try, but y'all see. So that's and you saw the depiction of him up where we on time. Okay, cool. Um, King of Alban. Now where? What is Alban? Let's 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 go back here. Let's actually pause. Mm. 
So basically, a, a cursor, cursor. So basically, a cursory glance at a uh, Wikipedia of all places um, says that uh, Alba is is just Gaelic or ancient Gaelic for Scotland. So when they're speaking about Kenneth the King of Alban, they're saying the King of Scotland or what would later on become become Scotland. Uh, I also found this as well, King Kenneth Dupe. So again, here's the depiction that I had before. Um, and then you can see King Constantine the third and King Kenneth the third and as you can see they start to get lighter throughout history I wonder why that is uh, We can actually I have a slide about that. So let's pull that up real quick um, Where is it where is it where is it where is it one moment y'all Intermixture Okay, so now this is going into um, why is it that that everyone seems to get lighter and lighter throughout time? If you really, if you dig further and further back, you find people that look more like me. If you go further and further forward, you see people that look more like Brad Pitt, Jake Gyllenhaal, somebody like that. Okay, so um, others were born by renegades from other clans who were perhaps not of native blood okay or they may have all or they may have been all native men although bearing names of other clans in which clans they in in which clans they had been of the commonality um might bear the same sir oh excuse me highland genealogy is rendered dreadfully uncertain and confused by the circumstance that two men or a, a dozen men might bear the same surname and yet of be and yet be of wholly different descent so many people could have the same surname but be from completely different places and look totally different possibly you understand however um the above testimony proves that the majority of the Highland people were subordinate to one or more invading races whose chiefs stood to them in the relation of alien overlords in the first, but who gradually and inevitably became identified with the native people. You understand? Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Such people in the course of time became Gales in speech, uh, Gaelic. They're talking about Gaelic people. The, uh, such people in the course of time became Gaels in speech, and some of them became partially Gaelic in blood. But some, I dare say, have actually none of the Aboriginal blood in their veins. So as you can see, there's a significant amount of admixture, uh, or well, intermixture in these people. Do you understand? So not only, so you, so you, you mix that in with naming them something else like picked instead of mori and then uh, invading them and mixing in with their blood now all of a sudden you can refer to them under a different name and with a different picture and pretend like that's just who it was the whole time no it wasn't they were moors or mori people and they look much closer to me excuse me <laughs> it, my uh, recording cut out but yes yeah, so as you can see this is a standard denationalization practice intermix with the original people of the land and then call them something else refer to them by a different name and you've essentially denationalized the people okay or, or you're, you're on the, your way to denationalizing the people so here we go right here this is a minaret in the czech republic um, which is a little bit um, not not exactly in the same area as we're talking, but still, oddly enough, Moorish revival, quote unquote Moorish revival in the Czech Republic. Um, really, what that means is it was a structure that was already existing and may have been renovated, may have been they, they might have painted it or something like that. You know what I mean? They might have touched it up, and they basically laid claim to the entire thing. When really, no, that that structure had always been there and or at least in some fashion had been there and then was reconstructed later on through time. I just found that very interesting. And let's see if I can get to the other other one. Here we go. 
So this is the same the same one but closer up. So you can see this the structure of this one and then the structure of the next one. Yeah. Yeah, this is in a uh, lit lead nice. L E D N I C E. It's a minaret in lead lead nice. And you'll see it referred to as Moorish Revival, but we all know that that means it's it was pre-existing there and then probably renovated or painted or something like that, and they lay claim to the entire thing. Yeah. So. Whoops. Okay. Um. What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? So all throughout this book, he keeps uh, uh, David Mac Ritchie. So all throughout this book, David Mac Ritchie, he keeps drawing parallels in between the Moors of uh, the indigenous Moors of Scotland, which actually let's let's go into that slide real quick. Um, he keeps drawing uh, uh, lines from the indigenous Moors of Scotland to other Moors all throughout the world. And we'll get into that in just one moment. Oh my lord. An, extra, an extract which is of great importance also is tending to confirm all that has already that has been already said with regard to the indigenous Moors of Scotland. Although the crest of the McClellans was a Moor's head on the point of a sword, an allusion to their recovery, meaning they're taking over, not the recovery. There, there was nothing recovered. That that this word right here, this is a perfect example of how they rewrite history. This is basically a, a way to say that they they got back something that was already theirs when in reality they're actually stealing something that was never theirs to begin with even if the people who own that estate did not originally own the estate the people who originally owned the estate were still of the native people they were not of the invading people but these new people came in and invaded and they say they recovered okay uh re recovery to the estate of bombi after being forfeited by the slaying, so see again, this is how they do it, man. For, to forfeit means to give up something, right? It's usually to willingly give up something. Even unwillingly means that you give up something. But he says after being forfeited, comma, by the slaying of a gypsy chief who infested Galloway. By the way, no, also known as gypsy, meaning someone of the native land who probably looked much more like me and you than than other people you understand um so they they basically slay they slay they murdered this chief and they say they he forfeited the estate okay um they sometimes they sometimes used for a crest a mortar piece with the model superbo frango uh, here again, then, is evidence of a contest between an invading and presumably white people and a native and distinctly dark-skinned race who were clearly regarded as Moors. Let's talk about King David. Vigorously pursuing the fugitives with his soldiers elated with victory and entering Mordafia. Again, remember, all of the Moorish dominions are always going to start with M R M O R M U R. Somehow, the M R root is always going to be there. Even if the R isn't there, still, notice all of these names are starting with M. All of them. That cannot be a coincidence, okay? It's just too many names, <laughs> okay? You know, uh, Vigorously pursuing the, the fugitives with his soldiers. So again, remember the, the perspective that this is being written in. So fugitives mm -hmm, Okay um, Now deprived of its lord and protector he obtained by God's help possession of the whole of that large territory so um, And entering Morafia or Moray now being deprived of its lord and the protector so these invading forces then murdered the 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 head and the protectors of this land and now but with god's help permission or, or a possession of the whole of that territory so he obtained by god's help so he was able to murder as many people as he could and then gain control of that territory 
I, I gotta translate, you know what I'm saying? Um, okay. uh, this engagement is thus recorded in the Ulster Annals, battle between the men of Albin, or Scotland, and the men of Moray, in which fell 4,000 of the men of Moray, with their king, Oengus, son of the daughter of Lulag, a thousand also of the men of Albin in the heat of battle. Mr. Skeen also, uh, excuse me, Mr. Skeen adds that in a eulogium, eulogium, so I'm sure a eulogy, uh, of the day, King David is styled that invincible king who had subdued unto himself so many barbarous nations and had without great trouble triumphed over the men of Moray and the islands. In that same period, the natives of the Isle of Man, then under Norwegian rule, are spoken of as the barbarous natives. I mention this to show how one race looked upon the other or the others. Some of the conquered Moray men, or Moors, seem to have fought under King David's banner as Moravenses. Mora Moravenses. A few years after this, but there, but there were others of them still unsubdued in spirit. So there were still a few of them that um, were outside of the banner of King David and retained their name and still were fighting to, to make sure that they could stay free. Okay. Um, uh, he then, to prevent any future trouble, removed them all from the land of their birth and scattered them throughout the other districts of Scotland, both beyond the hills and on this side thereof. So, like I was saying earlier, I believe this is this is actually a um like a, a, a what was before what I showed earlier. But still, this shows how they took the native people of the land and then dispensed them all throughout different parts. Okay, so that they can then say, oh, well, we've always been here. We're peaceful people who have always been here. No, they've they've either killed or displaced and denationalized as many people as they possibly can from that indigenous place, okay? Where are we on time? Okay, we're all getting close, getting close. So I just want to show more illustrations of um, Irish crests. Family crest of Christie, Feinheim, Farringham, Gorton, Guten, uh, Hardy, Mordant, Mordaunt, Par Panel, Pert, Shipley. And that's from the Fair Fairbairn Book of Crests, plate 129. Clearly, oh, oops. Clearly, you can see the depiction of, of do I need to make this any bigger so y'all can see? As you can clearly see, this is the family crest of. of um, I checked the Fairborn book, Fairborn book of crests too, and uh, this is a Scottish, or it's either no, it's I Irish. I think it's Irish, um, an Irish crest right here. Okay. King James of England um, and King James the First of England. And King James the King James the first of England and the sixth of Scotland by Hendrik Hondius, 16 Portrait Gallery, London. You can see now this this guy clearly seems a little bit lighter in complexion, but still you can see a little bit of the the indigenous people and kind of left their mark here on him. You know what I mean? His hair. It's cut short, but a bit more wavy, a little, and his beard is clearly a little bit more curly, so you can see. So even up until um, 1608, the the mark of the indigenous people were still there on the nobility of Scotland. Okay. <sighs> Who else? What else? What else? What else? What else? Ah. Let's get into this right quick. Now remember what I said earlier about Black Moors, guys. Remember, do I gotta show you guys? Do I gotta let's let's let's, let's look in the dictionary right quick, okay? Just so y'all can see that I'm not 
I'm not trying to, you know what I mean. Here we go right here. Oh. Come on now. Can y'all see? Noun, black and more, a Negro, a black man. So when you see the term black more, just know who we're talking about. We're, we're talking about Moors. We're really talking about Moors. But the people who have uh, the people who have been known historically for thousands of years as Moors and have now been denationalized today uh, and are referred to now as black. That's who we're talking about, since I gotta be so direct with it. Okay, we're good on time. Oh. What you don't want me to know? No. See, see, the government don't want us to know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, man. man. Trying to, trying to stump my growth, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, this is just the same thing. The British picks like those of other lands stand out again as dark skinned men. Okay, we're not gonna. Okay. I thought I had I thought I had something else to that, but um Oh, this is it. I'm sorry. That was the wrong page. I just named the, the files something similar. <laughs> you see, you see my highlighter was dying. <laughs> okay. Whatever horrible super superstition may have given rise to such a bloodthirsty custom, I believe they're talking about let's see. King of Ashanti caused 200 young girls to be slain in order that their blood might be used for mixing with the mortar employed with the building of his new palace. Yeah, um, people got, people got down. People got, people definitely got down back then. I'm not trying to excuse it at all. I'm just saying people, it was a lot of people who got murdered in order to, um, build basically the foundation for certain castles. So both men and women, in this particular case, it was a lot of young women, but men and women as well. It was understood that the girls had been captured from some neighboring tribe into whose territory the king's brother had made incursions in order to procure the required number of victims. Whatever horrible superstition may have given rise to such a bloodthirsty custom, it was also practiced by the savage Black Amours of early Scotland. Castles remarkable for size, strength, and antiquity are by the common people commonly attributed to the Mori people or Moors, <laughs> uh, who, who are not supposed to have trusted solely to their skill in masonry in constructing these edifices, but are believed to have bathed the foundation stone with human blood in order to prop propitiate the spirit of the soil. So they basically believe that this bathing the, the, the um, foundation of the structure will imbue it with certain forms of energy. And um, this is not the first time in history that that custom has been used. You understand it's uh, human blood throughout all of history in many different places has been used in a lot of different ways. So I'm, again, I'm not trying to uh, excuse it. I'm just saying, you know, we're not a perfect people. We need to get rid of that whole victim mentality because we've done a lot of things too. No matter where you think we came from or no matter who you think we are, We've done a lot, guys. We've we've done a lot in our history. So, okay. So I'll talk about this right quick. So, um, this is this is tying in the the Phoenicians, um, the Jews, the Hebrews. Okay. All right. So let's see where to start. The ancient Hebrew measure of omer and cubit continues to be used in this isle. I'm talking about the island of Saint Kilda. Okay. Uh, and whatever the fact may be worth, the emblem known as Solomon's seal, and they're talking about the, the, the Jewish star of David, um, the hex alpha, Solomon's seal. Uh, the emblem known as Solomon's seal has been found by Scottish antiquaries upon many a sculptured stone. 
there seems little doubt that the Phoenicians at any rate were here. Phoenicians being early Moors, okay? They are said to have crossed the Atlantic and planted a settlement in Florida. Florida. <laughs> that's another video. We'll talk about the Moors in America and all that. Um, that's, that's, that's deep. We'll, we'll deal with that later. Uh, where are we on time? Okay, we're getting close. And in various parts of Africa, and they ha they are admitted to have visited all the western coasts of Europe, all the western coasts of Europe, and in the time of Hiram, king of Tyre, that, that should be familiar to some of you, are you traveling men, riding that goat, Roger? <laughs> Hiram, king of Tyre, uh, who have to, to have voids far and wide in search of treasure at the bidding of Solomon the Great. They are supposed to have traded at this time with the metal workers of Cornwall and, and to have colonized some parts of Ireland and presumably it was during that period that the seal of Solomon was carved upon the Scottish stones. So even the Hebrews were in Scotland and Ireland at a certain point in time. So that basically wraps it up for me guys. Um, I feel like I've, I've put out enough information for you guys to start looking um, and start to uh, educating yourself and hopefully you were educated throughout this. Um, I will continue to speak about the Moors uh, of old, the, the Moors from uh, ancient history, from you know not so ancient history, contemporary times, all throughout Europe, uh, Asia, Africa, America, uh, being North Central and South America, there's plenty of information out there. Um, that points to it uh, if you want to follow me you can follow me I'll put my Instagram somewhere you can follow me on that um, and please please consider donating to my cash app because um you know I do a lot to make sure that these videos can can be seen and heard throughout the world um, by different people and uh, to, to put these presentations together this literally is a culmination of months and months of research literally it's not just me you know just cracking open a book and just highlighting a bunch of things and then really you know this comes from this this comes from me building my understanding of history and uh, months and months of research not just from this book but from multiple other books you saw me cross-reference um this this source with the american dictionary of the english language and certain things so um i do a lot i really do a lot to make sure that these videos are possible so please consider a donation anything would help um, any little bit, even a dollar, I would be very, very grateful and thankful for. So, thank you so much for watching. Hope you guys have a good day. Until then, Islam, I'm out.